Trusting Jesus, that is all. What a wonderful blessing it is that that is all, that we don't also have to do a whole bunch of works because otherwise none of us would ever make it. Trusting Jesus till within the jasper wall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. We're on Sing Unto the Lord, part seven today. <coughs> and every week I keep finding new exciting things. This series may never end. No, it will end at some point. Uh, the rapture will come or I'll die or <laughs> nobody will show up for church. Uh, anyway, we're over there in that passage in Exodus, which uh, we've been looking at for the last six weeks, n- number seven today. And what we've seen thus far is that music is not merely an issue of the culture wars. Music is a central issue in the long spiritual war against God. That's because the two opponents in the war are musical beings. God himself is a musical being, and he's an uncreated musical being. The devil is also a musical being, but he's a created musical being, and that's important for our study because it means that the devil can never originate anything, but he always has to copy and pervert. What God makes that is good, the devil copies it and perverts it. He takes every good gift that God has ever given and twists it and makes it perverted. You think of sex, for example. God made it holy. God made it beautiful. God made it for the context of marriage. The devil takes it and perverts it. Everything about the world around us, Satan takes that which is beautiful and makes it tarnished and dull and ugly. He cannot originate anything. He can only pervert the good things that God has made. We saw that one of the key elements in our discussion so far in the New Testament tells us that musical instruments by themselves can communicate a message even without words. And we read that over in 1 Corinthians 14, 7. (coughs) And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sound, how shall be known what is piped or harp? And, of course, we've talked about the context, which is the speaking gifts, uh, and in particular, in that case, the gift of tongues. And they were all to give an articulate, understandable biblical message in the language of the listener. Now we're going to talk about the language of the listener a little bit later on because that's a very important element when we begin to discuss why music is not merely a cultural thing. There has to be a distinction in the sounds. So the music principle we've learned, number one, God ordained musical instruments to be used in divine worship. Two, music is seen in scripture as a vehicle for giving honor. Third, music is seen in the Bible as a means of spiritual and emotional healing. Fourth, having the right kind of instruments does not therefore make the right kind of music because you can play bad music on good instruments. On the other hand, somebody with the wrong worldview who performs music written by a composer with the right worldview can faithfully communicate the truth musically. And most of the church doesn't seem to understand that. (coughs) Fifth, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. And we saw many different passages that dealt with that. Last week, we looked at number six. The corollary truth that the objective purpose of music is to glorify God. The objective purpose. In some way the music doesn't actually glorify God and direct your thoughts to him, you need to question whether or not that music is right. If the music merely stimulates the flesh to carnal passion, it is not from God. Truly Christian music must glorify God. And we spent some time looking at that phrase out of 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now that includes all the everyday kind of activities like eating and drinking because that's where he starts. Wherefore, therefore, uh, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Ask yourself the question. I'm going to pause. This isn't in the notes. (coughs) But just ask yourself the question. When I go out to eat or when I cook something at home to eat, am I doing this for the glory of God or am I merely stuffing my face as full as I possibly can? Why am I eating? Am I doing it for the glory of God? Because the glory of God includes things like your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Whether, therefore, you eat. How about what you drink? Hey, are you into liquor? I sure hope not. When you sit down, you have your glass, and then you have your second glass, and then you have your third glass, and then you have your fourth glass, Are you doing that for the glory of God? Now, I know some folks um, used to have a problem with that. There was a a fellow back in the 1950s. He often went on the sawdust trail, we called it, and he gave his testimony. 
said, the things I used to do, those are the things I don't do anymore. He'd been a severe alcoholic. He couldn't control it. He thought he could. He kidded himself. He told everybody else, I, can, I got it under control. He didn't have it under control. When he got truly converted, he realized what I'm doing is sin. He didn't have it under control. He quit lying to himself, and God broke him of the bottle habit. There have been people who ended drugs. Some of you know some people like that. And they couldn't break it, and they couldn't break it, and they went through all kinds of 10-step programs just like the alcoholics have, and they couldn't break it, and they couldn't break it. When they got truly saved, God broke it. God took it away from them. He changed their lives. What you drink, do it to the glory of God. If you're not doing it to the glory of God, if you're merely doing it to fuzz out the world around you, it's not to the glory of God. If you're doing it because, man, it gives you a nice buzz and you like the feeling, you're not doing it for the glory of God. If you're doing it because you can't help it, you've got to do it every time you sit down at the table, you've got to have a beer or you've got to have a whiskey or a wine or whatever you happen to be into. You're not doing it for the glory of God. Instead, it's controlling you and it's destroying you and it's destroying people around you you know I'm telling you the truth. Some of you used to have a problem like that. And it destroyed you. It made you lose all your money. It made you lose all your resources. Some of you had some really nice resources that got, got trashed because you got thrown out of your place because you were alcoholic and you couldn't pay your rent. And God saved you from that. Praise God. And you don't go back to it and you don't want to go back to it. But some of you, maybe you're still doing it. And it costs you more than you know. Whether therefore you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Have you got a secret habit? You got a secret bottle hiding under the kitchen sink? I, when I was a pastor in a church up in North Jersey, there was a lady who came to one of the Bible studies. She's a young lady, beautiful young lady, a couple of kids. It was a, a ladies' Bible study that I was teaching. There were four or five of these young women that were in that Bible study. And this woman had a problem with cigarettes. A problem. She was an addict. And, you know, she would come under conviction. And she'd go home and throw them all away, except she would leave one pack just in case. And every week she'd come back totally defeated and tell the ladies' Bible study, you know, uh, so I thought I'd got them all. And this week I really thought I'd got them all. But then I was, I had to get some cleaning fluid out from under the kitchen sink, and there was a pack. And she said, I couldn't resist the temptation. <laughs> and so she smoked the whole pack. The Bible says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You got drugs? You got smoke, you got booze, you got porn. Well, just one magazine. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What you do, you don't throw the porn magazine in the trash, somebody else will find it. You take it and put it through the shredder or burn it. You got cigarettes, you soak them thoroughly and put them not just in water, but soak them in something horrible like ammonia or something so nobody would ever be tempted to try to dry them out and smoke them again. You got booze, you pour it down the sink. What besitting sin do you have? Whether therefore you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. If what you're eating and drinking doesn't glorify God, don't do it. Now, enough meddling. Let's get back to preaching. Okay, <clears throat> so the objective purpose of music, therefore, is to glorify God. If the music doesn't directly glorify God and direct your thoughts toward him, you need to question whether or not it is the right music. <clears throat> Do all to the glory of God. And ultimately, all of creation will fulfill that uh, purpose for music. We saw that over in Revelation chapter 4. Ultimately, even the pagans will fall down and glorify God. Now, that brings us to point number 7, which we began last week. Music and worship. Music and worship. This is point number seven. This is the seventh principle. The principal purpose that God designed music for is worship. And um, 
I'm going to say this again. I said it last week, but I'll say it again. In fact, I put a bulletin insert in there, this number one on that bulletin insert. Some of you are always late, so you miss one of the principal elements of worship that God designed. So if you look in your bulletin insert, there are ten things that require zero talent, and being on time is number one. When you're habitually late, you're telling God that one of the principal elements of worship is not important to you. Those of you who show up late are usually 25 to 30 minutes late. So it's time for a reality check. Those of you who work must be at the job somewhere between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Morning worship doesn't start until 11 a.m. That's between two and four extra hours of sleep and later than you have to be at work. If you were 30 minutes late for work every day, you'd get fired. And that reveals something about your priorities. You honor your boss more highly than you honor God. You value your paycheck more highly than you value God's worship. And believe me, friends, like I told you last week, someday you will stand before God and give an account for your slovenly attitude toward worship. And as I said last week, believe me also, I will give testimony against you in that day, and I will testify against you for all of your other wicked carnality. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I'm going to have to give an account for me, no question about that. But I also have to give an account for you, and that's what it says in that verse, and I want to be able to do it with joy and not with grief. And so I read you a little quote last week from Doug Lehman, who's a missionary to Brazil, that section dealing with worship. <clears throat> Psalm 115.8, in the context of idolatrous worship, teaches you that you become like what you worship. And this truth is good news or bad news depending upon what you worship. If you worship the true and living God, you will become holy, just, and wise as he is. If you worship idols, you will become deaf and blind and dumb, verses 4 through 7. All humans are inescapable worshipers, and worship is the key and most foundational defining reality. Get that. I love that sentence. Worship is the key and most foundational defining reality for human life. God is worthy, and the beauty of his redeeming love constrains God's people to worship, unquote. He's got it right on. He nailed it on the head. Since music is one of the principal elements of worship, the others being prayer, the Lord's table, and the proclamation of the word of God, we become like the music that we use in the worship of God. If it is carnal music, we become carnal. If it's dull and repetitive, we become dull and repetitive. If it has no defining points, it just fades in and fades out, we will have no defining points either, no touchstones, solid things in our lives to provide the rock and ground of our being. If it stimulates our sin nature, our sin nature will control our so-called Christian life. If it has no godly creative variety, it will become uncreative and inflexible. If it has no structure, our lives will begin to have no structure. If it's trivial, we become trivial. You get the idea. Music is an essential element of worship. <coughs> we were made to worship, and when we have that kind of junk music, we become like that, and so does our worship. We've already discussed how that principle flows over into all of life. If we're covetous, God says we're idolaters. Money becomes our God. There are lots of false gods available in the world. Music is one of the most powerful false gods, along with money and sex and power. We don't want to admit it when we're worshiping a false god, especially if the false god is carnal music. We pretend that we're worshiping the true God with our music. We use the right terms and the names, but in truth, we're worshiping the golden calf. And we went over that passage over in Exodus 32. And Aaron building the golden calf and saying, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Who brought them out of the land of Egypt? It was Jehovah God. Did a golden calf go in front of them in a cloud of fire by night and a pillar of a cloud by day? Did a golden calf cut the sea in half for them? Did a golden calf send ten plagues to Egypt? No, the golden calf with its disc between its head was one of the, the gods of Egypt. That wasn't the god that brought them out of Egypt. That was one of the gods that got smashed by the true god of heaven. But Aaron said, okay, this is the god that brought you out of Egypt. Here's something you're familiar with. Here's something you like. Here's something from your old past. Here's something from the way you used to live in Egypt as slaves. And that's the god that brought you out. Some of you came out of bad backgrounds with that kind of bad music, and so you still love that kind of bad music, and you think of that really nicely now because, after all, it's got Christian words stuck to it. You know, that particular passage in Exodus 32 is one of the most important historic passages quoted in the New Testament. This is all new material, by the way. 
one of the most important historic passages quoted in the New Testament, to severely warn the church and scare us out of our wits and out of our lethargy. That passage in Exodus 32 is quoted by Paul to the church as a severe warning. It's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want you to see what it's tied to. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So here he is back in the Exodus. This is where we are, book of Exodus, okay? So Paul is quoting that. Now why does he have to say as much as he does? Because he's writing to Gentiles at Corinth. Gentiles would not have known as much of the history of Israel. So you can't just say, well, this is only related to Israel in the Old Testament. No, Paul says, let me give you some principles from some events that actually occurred in the Old Testament that are designed for you in the church. Here's some warnings for you in the church. Wish we had time to expound the whole passage, but I'm just giving you the background. It says, with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Yeah, all but two people who came out of Egypt, who were above age 20, died in the wilderness. All of them died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. Those are the only two guys that made it that were above age 20 at the Exodus. God was not well pleased. God killed them. Do you think he will do any less to you? That's why Paul is writing this as a warning. It's designed to scare you out of your wits. I hope it does. It scares me out of my wits. Now these things were our examples, verse 6, to the intent. Here's the purpose. Here's the reason that God wrote those things down in the Old Testament so that you today in the church would know that this is an example for you as believers. What's going to happen to you? To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Do believers ever lust? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we ever lust after evil things? Yes. Okay. What happened to the people who did? God killed them. Dead, 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 dead. That's an example for us, folks. Look at verse 7. Here we are, golden calf, Exodus 32. <coughs> you got golden calves in your lives? Listen, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. And that was about the Jews. And he's writing it to Christians who are believers in the church. A Christian can be an idolater, as were some of them, as it is written. Now here is a direct quotation out of the passage that we read in Exodus 32. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That is a direct quotation out of Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. Let me read you verse 6 of Exodus 32. They rose up early on the morrow. They offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 6 is the verse that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 10. And God killed them. Verse 8, he goes through a bunch of different times in Israel's history where God killed them. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. God killed 23,000 people in one day for having illicit sex. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. When they murmured and complained in the wilderness, you know what, they were putting Christ to the test. Well, what they didn't know it was Christ. Oh, but the Bible says it was. Because he was the one who led them through the wilderness. Do you ever murmur? How about verse 10? Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Do you ever bellyache about the church? Do you ever bellyache about what God's doing in your life? Do you ever bellyache about your family? Do you ever bellyache about your situation in life and what God has given you and what he's taken away from you? That one scares me very much. 
because I know deep in my heart there are times I want to complain and I say forgive me Lord I don't want to complain I know what happened to the Jews we think complaining is a little sin God said it's capital punishment for that sin he doesn't like it when you complain about what he is doing because you're telling him that he's stupid and that you're smart and that he doesn't know what he's doing and that you know better what ought to be done because after all you are the center of the universe and not him Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now he says it again in verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's writing to believers in the church. Do you get it? God killed people who insisted on doing their own thing. And did you see the context also? where that verse was that we just quoted out of Exodus 32, 6. Did you get the point? A believer can be an idolater. That's both verse 7 and verse 14. <coughs> Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You think you're okay? You think, well, it doesn't really apply to me. It applies to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to me. A lot of Christians are like that. They think all the rules apply to somebody else, but not to them. And you know, what just crossed my mind is I was standing out here waiting for Keith this morning to, before we pray, before we come in, and I saw the sign there on the door. It says, please don't bring any food or drink into the auditorium. And I wonder how many of you have ever walked past that sign and you've gone ahead and brought it on in. You've treated the church the same way that you would treat a movie theater, where you got your popcorn and you got your can of soda and you're sitting there with your feet up on the back of the chair in front of you and watching some ugly flick go across the screen because I know people do it because I find the empty bottles under the uh, the pews water bottles not beer bottles which I'm thankful <laughs> but uh, I find them under the pews in other words the people said as they walked through that door that applies to everybody else it doesn't apply to me you can go for one hour without having to have a snack or something to drink and if you really need it get up and go out to the back to the water fountain don't bring it in Well, I'm on a roll today, huh? A believer can be an idolater. Why would a believer want to be an idolater? I mean, you know, believers want to be idolaters. Did you know that? I'll tell you why. Because idols give pleasure. Idols give satisfaction. Idols are fun. Idols help you fit in with the crowd. Sure, I'll have another beer. Idols are the drug that makes you think that you're okay because after all, you're trying to worship God. maybe in a way that he didn't command. But you know, best of all, idols provide only the lowest moral, mental, emotional, and spiritual standards. They provide the lowest possible standards. That makes you feel good. You can meet that standard. Idols never require any real sacrifice from you. Idols very quickly begin to control the motives and desires and attitudes and thoughts and words and actions of the idolaters. If idols were no fun, there would be no idolaters. Have you ever thought about that? If idols were no fun, there would be no idolaters. But because the idols satisfy the flesh, idolaters never want to give up their idols. You know, carnal Christians worship many different idols. For example, there are multiple types of idols that correspond to the seven deadly sins. <coughs> now remember, the budaks. I invented three budaks, and I've told you at least one of them. I may have told you more than one, but I've invented at least three budaks to help you remember the seven deadly sins. Does anybody remember the budak that I taught you? A budak is where you take the first letter of each word and then you put it together in some kind of a nonsense sentence uh, so that you can remember all the things in that uh, particular list. There are what are called seven deadly sins. Who remembers the budak that I gave you? Anybody? I remember. I don't remember what you said. <laughs> I know. That's the whole point. <laughs> you remember that I said it. It's just a question of what did I say. Okay. Thank you for being honest, Ed. <laughs> okay. Let me give them to you again. You can write these down because one or another will strike your fancy and you'll be able to 
to remember the seven deadly sins because these are really key issues about what we're talking about right now, the idolatry that we all go through. The first one is glass peg, G-L-A-S dash peg. So think of a peg that you're going to pound into the ground except it's made out of glass, G-L-A-S dash P-E-G, glass peg. Another one is uh, gap legs, G-A-P dash L-E-G-S. Those are easy because they're weird things that you can think of. The last one, think about a fried egg, taking it and hitting somebody in the face with a fried egg. That one is egg, E-G-G, dash, slap, S-L-A-P. So you take the egg and you go slap, okay? Now, those all stand for the same thing. Those all have the same set of letters in them. I just scrambled them different ways because some people like to memorize it a little differently. <coughs> Number two is obviously easy to remember. Think about the kid from England, and uh, he came over and... Uh, to the United States and over in England he'd been a real classical education and you know he'd studied Shakespeare and all of uh, those kinds of things and he decided to visit the American West with his mom and he saw all these cowboys walking around like this with their bow legs because they ride the horses you know and their legs after a while get bow legged but he knew that it was implied to say hey mom look at the bow legged cowboys so instead he said mother what manner of men are these which wear their legs in parentheses? <laughs> Gap legs, okay? You're going to remember that. I want you to remember this, okay? Just like I was trying to teach you the ten different plagues of Egypt in their correct form, in the correct order. Okay. <clears throat> so the ten deadly sins, or seven deadly sins, are greed, lust, pride, gluttony, anger, envy, and sloth. But each one of those parallels an idol that Christians don't like to give up. For example, mon money, that's the, the idol of many Christians. That's greed. That's the deadly sin of greed. Some Christians focus on sex. That's the deadly sin of lust. Some focus on power. That's the deadly sin of pride. Some focus on food. You know, Paul talks about them. He says, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. That's the center of their life. That's the deadly sin of gluttony. Some are always jockeying for position and they blow up their stack when they don't get in number one place. That's the deadly sin of anger or wrath. Some possessions, that's the deadly sin of envy because somebody's got something they don't have. Or the deadly sin of, oh man, I want an easy life. That's the deadly sin of sloth. Let's be late to church again. And of course, there's the false god of pagan music that's dressed up in Christian clothing. It's using Christian words to deceive the simpletons into worshiping a false god because the music itself glorifies the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. Remember, and this is a very important principle when we're talking about music, the vessel as well as the contents in the vessel must be holy if it's going to be used by the master. The vessel itself has to be clean if you're going to put clean contents into it. You're going to stick the word of God in it, that's clean content. You need to have a clean vessel. That's clearly seen in the New Testament, a couple of areas where you find the principle, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The vessel has got to be clean. How about 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21? But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. You use different things for different purposes. You all have a big vessel made out of porcelain in your house, but you don't use it to cook food in or drink out of. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. The vessel must be holy if it is carrying that which is holy. The music, if it's going to carry the words of Scripture, the music itself must be holy. So back to the text. Back there in Exodus 32, 15, Moses turned and went down from the mount, <coughs> and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, the one on one side and the other side they were written. And as they get, get closer to the camp, Joshua says, man, there's noise of war in the camp. And Moses said, no, that's the voice of them that sing I do hear. 
they thought they were singing Jehovah, but they had a false god. And of course, Moses ground it up and uh, then sprinkled it on the water, made the people drink the water. <coughs> and then, you know, Aaron's crummy excuse when Moses challenged him, he tried to pass the buck to the people, first of all. And then uh, he said it was just threw the gold into the fire, and out came this calf all by itself. So it really wasn't his fault. The idiotic excuses that we make when we are disobeying God. That wasn't the only golden half of the kiss, uh, calf in the history of Israel. We saw that it found its way again into Israel back in 1 Kings 12. 26 Jeroboam made the two golden calves, and the people went to worship them. So number eight, principle number eight, music and holiness. Music and holiness. Because the principal purpose for which God designed music is worship, therefore the required character of Christian music must be holiness. Let me say that again. Because the principal purpose for which God designed music is worship, therefore the required character of Christian music must be holiness. The required character of Christian music must be be holiness. I think most of us have forgotten or maybe never had the foggiest idea about the holiness of God. You see, holiness means separation. A saint is one who is, literally, hagioi, the, the saints, of those who are set apart in the New Testament. That which is holy is that which is set apart for God alone. It is not a cheap imitation. It is an original. We don't have to duplicate the defective styles of the world which were designed to give glory to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are worshiping the holy living God who is both the creator and the judge of all the earth. So you'd better make sure that your worship is holy, which means that you'd better make sure that your music is holy, not just borderline. Now, let's recapitulate for just a minute and ask what I asked a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> How does the requirement of doing all this for the glory of God apply to music? We began looking at that a couple of weeks ago when we started studying the issue of the glory of God over in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's short, but it's filled with an intense obligation that affects every area of our lives. It's a command to put God first and ourselves second. It means that putting music that glorifies God comes first and putting music that satisfies our flesh comes second. It means being a Berean. We read Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those at Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were soul. So what does it mean to be a Berean? Let's apply that to music. What does it mean to be a Berean when it comes to music? Check everything, including music, against the scripture to see if it does these things. To see if it denies, ignores, or compromises scripture in seven practical areas. There are seven areas of compromise. Compromise in the issue of separation is number one. Compromise in the area of carnality is number two. Compromise in the area of compromising any biblical principle. Biblical principles, number three. Number four, compromise in the area of worldliness. Number five, compromise with the lust of the flesh. Number six, compromise with the lust of the eyes. Number seven, compromise with the pride of life. Then you need to ask yourself another set of questions. Ask the question, will this cause somebody else to stumble? Here's a question you ask. Will this cause somebody else to stumble? Now, these principles I'm giving you are principles that apply in every area of the Christian life. We're simply applying them to music right now, but they apply in every area of the Christian life. Will this cause someone else to stumble? So be sure to check everything, including music, against the requirement to be an example. You see, you are an example, whether you like it or not. Be thou an example of the believers. Paul tells young Timothy to do that. So here is the question, will it cause any of these three groups to stumble? Number one, will it cause other believers to stumble? Number two, you're an example for children. Will it cause children to stumble? 
It's a serious one. Jesus said, anybody who offends one of these little ones, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Takes you back to Pharaoh and his army. Kill him, says God. Kill him, says Jesus. You want to be there? God killed Pharaoh and his armies and Jesus said it was a good idea. Especially if you cause a child to stumble. Better for you to be drowned in the sea with a millstone around your neck. Are you causing a child to stumble? Number three. You're an example. Are you causing an unregenerate world around you that's looking to criticize Christ? Causing them to stumble over the gospel because they see you as the example of the gospel. In other words, if you're involved in something that's questionable, you know what you're supposed to do? Don't do it. Don't do it. If it's questionable, don't do it. Because it has to be positively for the glory of God. Here's another one. Ask yourself this question. Who are my heroes? Who are my heroes? Who do I look up to? You know, because you tend to become like your heroes because you copy them. You know, that's true of little boys and their daddies. It's true of little girls and their mommies. It's also true in the Christian life. If Jesus is really your hero, not just the one that you babble about and you pretend he's your hero, but really in your heart you got a different idol in your heart, but you keep talking about Jesus because that looks spiritual and all the Christians say, oh, wow, what a spiritual person that is. If you really have Jesus as your hero, you will want to be like him. Let me give you an illustration. <coughs> a long time ago, I was talking to a person who had Elvis Presley as their hero. And apparently Elvis gave away millions of dollars, which was very impressive to this person, until he or she realized how much Elvis kept for himself, and the reason that he gave it away according to his own admission was to promote himself and to be considered a good person. Nice to give away millions? Wrong motive destroys it all. Your motives matter as well as your actions. The actions must be correct, not merely the motives, but actions do not whitewash motives. The correct actions without the correct motives are always wrong. Your actions can never whitewash your motives. Now, a few more things that help us focus on doing all for the glory of God. <coughs> doing all for the glory of God not only affects our overt actions, but it affects the things we choose to avoid and refrain from doing. It affects not only our personal speech, but to whom we speak, when we speak, where we speak, the content of our speech, the tone and intensity of our speech, the volume of our speech, the expressions and body language that we exhibit when we're speaking, the words we choose to use in each context, the avoidance of words and terms that reveal the flesh, the words that would uncover the seven deadly sins in our lives of anger, pride, envy, lust, sloth, gluttony, and greed. It informs and controls the minimal times when we actually refrain from speaking for the right reasons. It's an objective standard, not a subjective standard. Why? Because God never gives subjective standards. We've talked about that in the past. With God, everything is light or darkness, black or white. There are no shades of gray with God. Something is either sin or it is righteous. It's not halfway in between. And that, of course, is one of the main themes of 1 John, <coughs> where he makes it very clear that there is no darkness in God. That means there are no shades of gray. That means that God has an objective standard for the elements of worship also not shades of gray, including music. That brought us to principle number nine. We're not going to have time to, I wanted to add more to that as well. I added a lot to principle eight as we just talked about today. But the ninth was music and strange fire. So if you're at least taking notes, you'll know where we'll start next week. Music and strange fire. God never permits elements of strange fire in that which he uses in his worship. He will not permit strange fire on his altar, the center of his worship, and so God doesn't permit strange fire music in his worship either. And so the Lord willing, that's where we will pick it up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. And we pray that you will take it 
and use it for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We say our Lord, that means he is the boss, not us. He is the Lord, not merely our savior. He is the Lord of our life. He calls on us to bow the knee, to bend before him and to obey. Oh, Father, how we thank you that he is what has been called a benevolent despot, one who is indeed the Lord, but one who loves us, who treats us with gentleness and kindness, but he does expect obedience, and he expects holiness, and he expects music that is holy, because he designed it for worshiping him and to give him glory. Keep us from the carnality that insists on having our own strange fire on the worship altar of music. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.